You mentioned myostatin a second ago, which of course reminds me of uh, something that's been going around social media lately, which is uh, this interesting discussion about a gene therapy for mm. folostatin. Um, so for folks listening to us who haven't been following this, um, I guess there's a, there's a gene therapy out there where um, you you introduce a vector to somebody and you, I don't think you fully silence, but you, you clearly attenuate, uh, actually, no, I'm sorry, you activate the gene for folostatin. That makes more of the folostatin protein, which inhibits uh, the expression of the myostatin gene or maybe inhibits the protein myostatin, one or the other. And this, of course, is theoretically interesting because of what we know about the actions of myostatin. Um, I, when I think back to images that stand out from my first year of medical school, clearly on the top 10 list. You haven't even said it. I already know what you're talking about. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah. talking about, right? <laughs> this is still like 20, more than 25 years ago. Yeah. I still remember sitting in class when they showed the myostatin knockout mice and cattle. Yeah. And do you want to just tell people what a myostatin knockout looks like? Yeah. So it produces a double muscle phenotype is what they call it. And if you look at these cattle, it's like, you would think it's Photoshop by how absurd it looks. This is like the Mr. Olympia of cattle, essentially. Like it would be no chance anyone would come close in, you know, cattle sport, <laughs> whatever. Um, and in the mice, same deal. They have uh, like a literally they call it double muscle, essentially, because it's you literally have double the muscle fibers as, uh, you know, the wild type. Yeah, the reference. So, and I remember like the chickens, the mice, the cattle. I mean, yeah. it was truly remarkable there's this dog too super jack dog I forget I forget what type it is but uh he yeah has the same and so, so so my roommate and i spent the rest of medical school just talking about we've got to figure out a way to inhibit our myostatin <laughs> yeah yeah okay so apparently now someone's working on this and they're claiming that for just i don't know twenty five thousand dollars for your first shot and maybe twenty five thousand for every subsequent shot you can get a gene therapy that will activate and produce more of a protein called folostatin that inhibits myostatin and so that should be good right yeah yeah it seems like at least in the literature in animals you see this uh you know the myostatin knockouts and you see this you know double muscle phenotype you would you know assume and you there is actual rodent data too where you see folostatin administration does enhance muscle like it does happen um and I guess as a result of that, there was a lot of these research chemical companies were very quick to come out with, you know, uh, freeze dried, like lyophilized folostatin product that had one milligram per per vial and you would buy it for, you know, hundreds of dollars. And then you would basically like shoot a vial a day or something of that nature and spend thousands over the course of a cycle, which was based on, you know, no data at all. Now this was this this was made. Uh, how did this peptide get created? Is this an FDA approved drug, or is this one of those? No, no it was like we know what the chemical structure is. Let's go get an Alibaba chemist to make and it. And technically, I'm trying to think. Yeah, okay, so got it. So you've got you've got this kind of gray market folostatin product out there. Yeah, and this one is not gene therapy. To be clear, too, it's literally yeah, just yeah, no. You're actually injecting the protein. Yeah, yep. yeah. So you would literally get bacteriostatic water, shoot it in, swish it around until it's mixed, and inject it in yourself. And the half life is like I don't know, a couple hours. So you'd have to inject them multiple times a day to have it be stable in your in your blood to actually get the effect presumably and essentially the outcome that we saw in the bodybuilding world because this has been around for like a decade plus at this point if not decades um was not really anything you know there'd be the random outlier who's like i gained 20 pounds in two days and it's like okay bro and everyone else got nothing essentially and then you couldn't help but think that guy was probably selling it or something yeah. so anyway not that impressive and we just assumed it didn't work and then we come to find out that there's these, you know, viral vector studies going on behind the scenes in rodents, and there was one in humans, I believe, too. And then more recently, there's this bacterial vector version of it, which is being created. And, you know, a lot of big names are getting it and stuff that Brian Johnson, biohacker dude, got it. And um, I have yet to see any actual metrics of before and after muscle growth or anything of that nature. He's kind of just produced 
apparently his follistatin increased. So presumably it's actually doing something. It's just is that outcome of more follistatin actually binding enough myostatin to have an effect that is worthwhile. And that is kind of where we get into, by the way, how is follistatin measured? Is there a, is there a, um, a certified assay for measuring follistatin? I don't think so. I think they're using their own like internal measurement as far as I know. So they have like their own assay that they've developed. So I don't really know. So we don't actually know if there's, there's, there might not be a validated assay for measuring this hormone. Or yeah, this protein, yeah. Rather. yeah I, I couldn't say for certain that it's actually measuring it correctly. So assuming that it is, it is increasing it. And then is that actually doing anything? Um, you know, the picture that you got sent was, uh, you know, obviously looked pretty impressive and objectively to me, it kind of looks like it has some of the hallmarks of, you know, fitness industry angles and like lighting manipulations and stuff. Yeah. What are some of the, so, so yeah, just to back up for a moment, uh, this discussion came out of, um, uh, a patient sent to me something off Twitter, which was like kind of a before after mm. of someone who had done this gene therapy. Um, but you know, just for folks who aren't in the space, including me, um, although I feel like I kind of can see the bullshit when I look at it, yeah. but walk through the, how do you take a pre and post photo and create the most difference? <laughs> Cause you've actually sent me pictures before yeah. of pre and post on the exact same day. Yeah. And they look totally different. So clearly there's no biologic difference, but there's a huge aesthetic difference. So what are the tricks that people use to manipulate photos shy of just straight up Photoshop? I'm sure similar to anybody watching has probably had a cheat day. And when I say cheat day, I mean, just the day you go off the rails and eat whatever junk you want, where you had horrendous distension of your stomach to the point where it almost looked like you're you know holding an alien baby or something like that is not uncommon for us to have all dealt with at some point some really bad digestive problems and a lot of times these before and afters are not actually shot and i'm not saying this is the case with this you know before and after by the way i'm just saying in the fitness industry pretty typical especially years ago when they could get away with more egregious examples of this and it's gotten a little bit better now but now there's Photoshop and all that shit. But anyway, you could, and what is typical, people would take the after shot and they would get their pump. You know, they would make sure that they have heavy down lighting. They'd be like oiled up potentially. Um, they would be uh, in the perfect circumstance, essentially for even temperature, vasodilation changes just in temperature very massively. I could go in your- So you want a higher temperature, presumably? Yeah. So if we went in your gym and we cranked the heat and I did, you know, five sets of curls, five sets of something, I could get my arm vascularity to look unrecognizable compared to what it is now. And then I could walk outside and you would see me just like disintegrate in front of you, essentially, as it all vasoconstricts from the cold. So that is something that is very abused in the before and after kind of um, transformation shots where they will achieve uh transient look that is not representative of them walking around and it is certainly not representative of the complete opposite circumstance that they do the before shot in so they will you know do everything perfect um and take their after shot which is you know as good as they can possibly look with all circumstances accounted for which is actually shockingly as much as you say you're aware of it and you know how what goes into it and you can call obvious bullshit you'd be shocked how many people in the fitness industry still can't do that you'd be like how'd you gain 30 pounds of muscle in like three weeks it's like dude <laughs> you should know this you watch these videos all the time come on so anyway and then you would take the before shot and depending how egregious you want to make it you you know, go in much worse lighting after you have successfully downed, you know, four to 5,000 calories of processed garbage food. Ugh. And, um, so you actually are swelling. You're yeah. so, you're, you're, you're so, in, you're so inflamed. Yeah. Think of everything you could do to look as horrendous as possible, even down to the facial expression of looking disappointed on camera with how, you know, abysmal your physique is. Right. Yeah. So you, and of course you deliberately stick your gut out yeah, to exaggerate yeah. it. Yeah. And it's not hard because you're so distended too. It's just like, you know, exaggerated plus you're distending it, plus you're looking disappointed. Plus you're not, you're flexing. not flexing. Yeah. You're rolling your shoulders forward instead of rolling them back. You're not, you know, you have no pump. You just walked outside. You've been hanging out, eating shitty all day. There's a lot of things that 
it sounds like these factors are not significant enough to make this big of a difference until but you see them all stacked yeah and if you haven't gotten to 10 percent body fat or less i can't highlight enough how dramatic it can really get like sometimes you will see a guy who's 150 pounds who's shredded in the perfect lighting circumstances the guy could look like a mr olympia competitor through angles lighting etc and then you see him in real life with a t-shirt on you're like dude do you even work out <laughs> like that's how dramatic it gets um so and i don't know why people don't well i think i know why i think a lot of people have never got there to know what the difference is but when you're lean it's a pretty dramatic how much you can fudge things and it is abused to high hell by people who want to sell things so anyway in this circumstance i'm not saying that's what happened like there was a pretty impressive before and after for what is supposedly i don't know if he used you know drugs alongside it that wasn't really at least clearly disclosed at the glance i took at the caption maybe it was but there was no change in nutrition and exercise supposedly and he looks quite a bit better but it also you know had a little bit of the you know the sniff test was a little bit like eh, you're kind of like sticking your head out a bit you know are you trying to look worse so i don't know like the guy uh it's i don't he seems like a nice guy the guy who's kind of like at the forefront of um speaking about its utility and all the uh you know viability it may have in regenerative medicine and there's no viralizing outcomes either because it's not acting through AR. It's like an independent mechanism. So like, it sounds cool in theory, but the outcomes we see at least clinically have not been impressive enough for me to be, you know, floored by it. So I'm not sure if the, you know, the transformations we see online are typical or if they're, you know, a little bit exaggerated or what, but um, I think there's some level of, you know potential exaggeration that comes with this stuff yeah and how much muscle mass are they because they did a, a sort of open label trial didn't they oh the phase one yeah 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 so they um i don't know if it's published now or if it i think he said it will be i think soon. they're submitting it i don't know if it's been accepted anywhere yeah so it looks like the lean body mass gain was statistically significant but not that impressive from what i recall it was like two pounds yeah something like that and then what do they have like inflammation markers which were kind of like stayed the same yeah there was no the, the only p values to my recollection that were uh statistically significant was an increase in lean body mass to you said about to the tune of about two pounds um i think there was something else i don't remember what it was maybe a slight change a slight reduction in body fat oh intrinsic biological age so i don't know if you want to speak to the validity of those tests because i think you're there is none <laughs> okay okay so I mean, there, there's none those are those are meaningless um i think there was about a one percent decrease in body fat that was statistically significant if my memory serves me correctly yeah i don't know if they can it didn't seem like they controlled for exercise or anything so i don't really know how like what the takeaway is yeah yeah I, I i was surprised at how little the effect was if this mechanism matters mm. um and it might not matter right in other words it might be the case that while you know knocking out the myostatin gene at birth produces a profound muscular phenotype attenuating the gene later in life might not do much um, I did, I did ask one of my analysts to look this up today. Um, and, um, she, she found an experiment where they took mature mice. So, you know, call it like a two year old mouse and they did a near complete, um, um, block of the myostatin gene. So not a hundred percent knocked out, but like more than 99% of the, um, MRNA mm -hmm. was deleted and it did increase muscle mass in the mice by about 25%. But, you know, again, 25% increase in muscle mass is significant, but that's at basically completely knocking out myostatin. Whereas if you do that at birth, as you said, you're gonna more than double mu muscle mass. Yeah. So that also suggests that, you know, best case scenario, if you did this in a developed individual, you're, you know, you're gonna get big results, but it's not game changing. And of course, you know, doubling or, you know, tripling folostatin levels, which, kind of indirectly work on this pathway 
it, it's possible this would have no effect. I mean, you'd have to sort of see this studied more rigorously, yeah. potentially with people who don't have a conflict of interest, um, mm. which is also something you have to be careful of when you look at this type of literature. Um, but I don't know, I guess I wouldn't bet on it would be my two cents. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm uh, apparently there's a phase two trial that is happening either in Canada or Japan. And then there's six months results that are more impressive that they're um, highlighting. So and these phase two studies are specifically for sarcopenia. So I'm assuming they're recruiting people over 60 who, you know, look, if you could add five or 10 pounds of muscle to somebody over 60, that would be really impressive. Um, do we have any insight into how much training stimulus is required to produce these effects? Yeah, I don't know what their phase two trial is going to encompass or the inclusion criteria or anything, but um, I don't even know if they're using training in the phase two as a, so it's tough for me to, I, like, I, I mean, literally it, just to, learned to me, an interesting <laughs> study would be a placebo, yeah, yeah. Um, a placebo group that trains, yeah. a treatment group, group that does not train, mm. and a treatment group that trains. That yeah. would be a very interesting comparison. Yeah, no, for sure. Because I'd love to see, you know, placebo who train to no stimulus treatment. And then, so you, you get two very elegant comparisons with those three groups. Yeah, no, that would be great. And like this stuff has definitely been hyped for years. So if there is a way to actually get the answer finally, like does follistatin work in humans and produce an outcome that is, you know, something you could, uh, you know, avoid anabolics entirely for the androgen sensitive that might otherwise need anti-catabolic action in later life or in a burn scenario or whatever. Like that seems like pretty useful to flesh out because SARMs definitely didn't pan out the way, you know, pharma had hoped. So if this was useful, that'd be good to know. Um, now, what's interesting though is wasn't there a trend towards didn't everything move in the wrong direction? I don't know if it reached statistical significance on lipids and metabolic markers. Oh, yeah. I don't really get it. It's like a glucose, resting glucose was elevated. Insulin went up. HDLC went down. Yeah. Trigs went up. LDLC went up. So all of those things kind of moved in the direction you would not expect if this were beneficial. One thing that is weird is this follicle, or sorry, folostatin, when I was looking it up, I kept seeing the FSH inhibition statements. And I was like, is this some sort of like precursor? And I'm misinterpreting the acronym because surely it's not intertwined with follicle stimulating hormone. But it turns out it actually used to be called like uh, follicle stimulating in inhibitor hormone or something. And it's like primary mechanism that was known was how it would inhibit the production of FSH at the pituitary, hmm. which is really weird um, that that is something that uh, apparently the isoform used in this vector is one that is less specific for that um, component of what folostatin typically does endogenously. But that is, I don't know if there's some off-target mechanism that is resulting in the the glucose aberrations or whatnot, but like I have no idea what would be causing it. Well, it'll be interesting to see the phase two, as you said, and hopefully they they um, they study it with a large enough sample size that you can sort of make sense of it. Yeah, anecdotally, there's some like big names that are using it and I don't know if it's placebo or what, or if some of them are getting good results and it's just like outliers or I don't know. I don't really know. Yeah. I got to tell you, my, um, my interest in hearing about what celebrities are achieving using, you know, any sort of treatment is zero. Right. And I'll tell you what, just for people to understand this nonsense, y you know, it doesn't matter what celebrity X achieves using drug Y if you have no idea how their diet has changed, how their exercise has changed, how many steroids they're taking alongside of it, whether they're being paid to talk about it. Like all of these things so dramatically impact what message gets filtered down to people that, um, you know, I, I just don't think we could work hard enough to increase the scientific literacy of people to help them make sense of this. Yeah. And, uh, just notable, by the way, for anyone watching who's not a member of the drive, like this is why I pay for your membership is like the trust factor I have in your stuff is like above and beyond any piece of content I consume, essentially. Like there's no bias, there's no financial incentive, even to the degree of you don't push companies you're an investor in, like it is just legit facts, totally unbiased. Here is Peter's opinion with no incentive 
inherently manipulating my opinion whatsoever. Like, so I just want to say I really appreciate what you do. And anyone who's not a member, you should go be a member right now. <laughs> Thanks very much. I really yeah. appreciate that.